Take your Bible now. I'm going to give you my text. And some of you are going to recognize it very quickly. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. My faithful and loyal associate preached from that text this morning in the early service. And as I was walking down, he said, please turn to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and my head came up. And I thought, hey, fella, you're treading on my text for tonight. So I called him this afternoon and, and kind of felt out what he preached. And uh, it's not going to be the same, all right? His is going to be much better than mine, but uh, it'll not be the same. There's a phrase there that just blesses my heart. And it opens a lot of Bible as you study its thought. That's, that's where God blesses me probably more than in any other fashion is just see something in the Bible that when you begin to trail it, it just opens up more and more things that, uh, that you've never seen and that you wonder, why didn't I connect that before? All right, so uh, Tommy, are you taking notes on this? All right, amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. What's he talking about? He's talking about the, the chapter previous. All these people that are listed there. He said they have compassed us about and they are observing our life understanding that they are observing our life, it puts a little pressure on us. That's what he's saying. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now I've heard a lot of illustrations concerning this thought. Weights versus sins. But I'm going to tell you this. If you've got a weight in your life and you don't lay it aside, very soon it'll be a sin. Amen. Amen. You got something holding you back. Lay it aside with the sin that does so easily beset us. You know it's not hard to take up bad habits. Amen. I mean it's easy to take up bad habits. He said lay them aside. Have I got on your sermon yet, Tom? Okay, give me time, give me time. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to look at this phrase, if you would please. The joy set before him. The Bible says that there was something before the Lord that enabled him to endure the cross, despising the shame. I want to preach about tonight. What could have been before the Lord? What could have he seen before himself and in the days ahead that could have so inspired him? The Bible says to endure the cross. Now the there's two things here you need to know. It was a terrible thing to endure the cross. Terrible thing for the physical punishment that the Lord went through. But then it says, despising the shame. It was a terrible thing, the shame that the Lord went through. And we can only imagine God himself, amen, divine son of God, who was God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, going through the shame of that crucifixion. We just cannot imagine the disgrace that that was. And yet he said there was some things out there in the future that I kept my eye on, made it worth everything. The joy 
that was set before him. The first thought I'll give you is this. There was the joy of fulfilling God's will. Man, that, he, he said, I never came here to do my will. Uh, if, if I could paraphrase that, it's kind of like Jesus was saying, this was not my idea. This was the Father's idea. And I came to do the will of the Father. And, and, and thank God for His determination that's, that, that one day He would be able to say, it is finished. I've done the will of my Father. And, and he, he, when, when the, the temptations came and uh, uh, one place he said, do you not realize that I could have called legions of angels to come and take me off the cross and set me free? I could have done that in a heartbeat. There was a time when he knelt there in the, uh, in the garden and said, Lord, if there be any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. God, I want to finish your will. I want to be totally, completely obedient to that that you sent me to do. And he could not vary from that. And he was looking forward to the day he could say, it is finished. In John chapter 17, he says this, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. I, I, you know, I believe that that was something of uh, Paul's uh, desire when he, I quoted this morning when he made the statement, you know, I've, I've uh, finished my course. I've run my race. I've, I've been faithful. I've, I've kept the faith. Amen. And he, he finished well. Amen. Can I challenge you? Every person in this room, I don't care how young you are, and some of you are not as young as you think you are. Amen. Someone said the other day, Preacher, you're only as old as you feel. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> what an encouragement that is. Amen. <laughs> what an encouragement that is. But we need to determine, God, help me finish well. Help me finish well. Several years ago, now, I got a, this, I'll tell you how long ago it was. It was a cassette tape that uh, Jerry Falwell put in mail, and I think he looked up every preacher's directory in the country and sent thousands of them out. And it was a message by Vance Havner. Now, if you, you probably don't know of him, but he was a country preacher, preached his first message standing on a peach crate. He was so small that he couldn't be seen over the pulpit. And they put a peach crate back here he was 12 years old, and he stood up in the First Baptist Church of Hickory, North Carolina, and preached his first message, and then preached all over the world. Great, great, great country preacher. And the message was, home before dark. And his message consisted of this thought. God, help me get home before I do something and embarrass you. God, I don't want to live all these years and then come down to the end and do something that embarrasses you. Amen. He wanted to finish well. We need that desire. And, and can I say this? If you don't make some commitment toward that end, you might not accomplish it. Amen. Satan loves to bring people down in, in the last part of their life. Their testimony is ruined, their legacy destroyed, and, and everything gone that they ever lived for by a bad mistake in the last part of their life. A few years ago now, about this same time, uh, I mentioned going to Southwide. I was uh, going to Southwide in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, Brother Tom Wallace came out. Uh, I believe he was the one who made the announcement. And he said, Dr. Jack Hudson, uh, was scheduled to preach this morning. And he's here in town. He's at the hotel. But he's had a terrible attack of arthritis. And he can't get out of the bed. But he sent 
the title of his message. And he said, before I introduce the man that's going to speak in his place, I'm going to give you the title of Dr. Hudson's message. Dr. Hudson was in the last years of his life. And he, pre- he said, I'm going to preach on this. How to keep from losing the game in the last quarter. Wonder how many games have been lost in the last quarter. Jesus said, I'm going to finish well. And he said, I'm going to complete the work that God has called me to do. The joy of fulfilling God's will. Secondly, there was the joy of fulfilling Bible prophecy. Amen. All the Old Testament prophecies was coming down to the end. And and he uh, was able to uh, uh, fulfill every one of those without violating one prophecy in the Word of God. Do you remember, and many of you could immediately tell me, do you remember the first prophecy mentioned in the Bible of Jesus coming? The first prophecy mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 3.15. The Bible says, I'll bruise his head and he'll bruise my heel. And in that crucifixion, he not only bruised the the, the head of the serpent, but he crushed the head of the serpent. Amen. Amen. He provided fulfillment to that prophecy. The joy of, uh, you remember said, uh, there's a scripture that says, unto you a uh, child is born. Unto you a son is given. And he talks about how all creation will be upon his shoulders. and All governments will be upon him and all that. And he fulfilled every prophecy. I, you know, it's amazing to me to see sometimes when people want to violate prophecy. They want to violate what the Bible promises. You know, the Bible says... All that cometh unto me that he'll receive. And he says, I will in no wise cast them out. Well, yeah, yeah, it can happen. It can happen. Well, you're violating promise. You're violating prophecy. And you know what? I want to be one of those that the Lord keeps. Amen. I want to be one of those that that, uh, when you get there, he may look at me and say, you was about the sorriest preacher I ever saved. In fact, you may bear the title of the sorriest. But I'm taking you in because I promised you I would. He promised me that he'd never leave me nor forsake me. That song that came up there a while ago that uh, Chaz was singing, the blood covers it. The blood takes care of it. The blood changes it. Every, every wit of it. Uh, think about this. If you were to get saved tonight and that work of the blood of Jesus Christ that's still on that altar, still sufficient to forgive sin, cleanses you and saves you. Amen. You're born again. Did you know that God knows every time you'll disappoint Him down the road? God knows every failure you're going to have. God knows every mistake you'll make. And yet He says, I'm willing to cleanse you knowing you're going to fail me, knowing you're not going to be the best Christian that's ever been knowing you're going to have your problems. Why would he save us knowing we're going to do that? You say, Preacher, do you think he knows that? Of course he knows that. There's nothing God don't know. Amen. God's in eternity. He's looking down. Time is our problem. It's not God's problem. And he's looking down. He says, I'm going to save you. But the day's coming when we're going to take it all back. You know what? I'm glad that's not the case. I'm glad he fulfills every promise he ever makes. 
the joy of fulfilling God's will, the joy of fulfilling Bible prophecy. The third thing I've written down is the joy, and I think this was on his heart, the joy of the first person saved. Amen. Now, I got two people in that category. I can't leave either one of them out. They're too good. Well, when Jesus was being crucified, there was a thief that said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today. Now, he didn't say, I tell you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's, that's, that's damaging the text. He didn't say that. He said, I tell you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I believe he could have looked up to the Lord and said, he made it worth it all. Amen. Amen. This, this one person that got saved. Uh, Tommy came to me this week and he said, Preacher, in Wednesday night service with the teens, we had a young man get saved. Amen. Amen. You know what? That makes it worth it all. Amen. That makes it worth it all. And, and Jesus, I, I can just say it, the joy that was set before him, he endured that cross. I, this was not on his mind, but, but to, to, humanly speaking, we have to use our process to understand. And, and can you imagine him saying, angels, are you ready? I can't do it. I can't do it. That thief's going to get saved. And I can't call the angels to take me off this cross. Amen. And then when he died, when he died, there was a soldier there that looked up and said, surely this was a righteous man. I believe that man got saved right there. He acknowledged the righteousness of the man who died on that cross. Amen. Sometimes we look at the thief on the cross and we say, boy, uh, it, it, it's not that easy. He, he took a shortcut. He was there and, and got saved. Boom, just, no, no. That thief on the cross did everything that you were required to get saved. Yeah. Amen. The thief on the cross was there. And, and uh, uh, the other thief was criticizing Jesus and, and uh, 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 railing upon Christ and, and he looked over at him and he said, what's wrong with you? Do you not realize that he's God? Amen. 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 And then he said, and he's dying and we're dying. First of all, you've got to recognize he's God. And then he said, and we justly, we're receiving the rewards of it. He acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged the deity of Christ. He acknowledged his sin, and then he asked God to forgive him and save him. That's all anybody needs to do. Amen. Amen. So, all that prophecy had to be fulfilled, and he was able to say, it is finished. Amen. That was the, the joy. The next thing I want you to mention is the uh, fourth thing, the joy, and, and I, 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 this is a little personal or maybe... But I think he got a great deal of joy out of defeating Satan. Amen. Amen. I mean, as far as you go back in the Bible, it's been like this. They've been in each other. The Lord threw him out of heaven. I don't think that went very well. Amen. The Lord uh, in the garden said, you're going to crawl on your belly the rest of eternity. And you're going to be despised and people are going to hate the thought of you. I do my best to fulfill that prophecy. Yeah. You're talking about a snake. Amen. Only good snake's a dead snake. Amen. Amen. Told you the story one time we came home and Carolyn, uh, I think, uh, I think it was Dan Tony with me. And we got out of the car and dropped Carolyn off at the house and she went in, and as we backed up, here she come running around the house, screaming, screaming. <laughs> oh, God, it's awful. Oh, God, it's awful. Oh, God, it's awful. I knew she had found our neighbor dead or something like that, you know. I said, honey, what in the world's wrong? And she said, there's two snakes on the back porch. <laughs> I said, Brother Dan, take care of that. 
So he went over and killed both of them. Smashed them. I threw them off in the grass. I said, I'll come back this afternoon and get rid of them. I come back that, this, that afternoon and they were cut up in pieces about like that. <laughs> just about an inch and a half long. I said, Carolyn, what in the world did you do? She said, I wanted to make sure they were dead. <laughs> I believe the Lord got a great deal of blessing Amen. out of defeating Satan. The joy that was set before it. Pretty soon, he said, I am going to come out victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And every effort of Satan is going to be foiled and every opportunity for any change is going to be over. His fate is sealed. He's going to He's going to be in hell forever and that's exactly where he deserves to be. Amen. He said in a little while, big boy, your days are over. Your days are over. There used to be a poem I had that uh, a man wrote that uh, I, I was slightly acquainted with. But he was talking about and he spoke it in a, and, and I, I don't say this disrespectfully if you if you assume that you're wrong, in a black dialect, he, he wrote it as a black preacher would write it. And he talked about death and how he pranced and, and uh, shouted with joy when Jesus died and said, I got him now, I got him now. And he goes on and he talks about uh, they come by one day and there death is. And man, he's beat up and he's wrinkled and he's damaged and he's bloodied and he's battered. And the old preacher says, death, what happened to you? Preacher said, and death says, oh, I was there at the tomb. Man, things were going good until the third day. And said he come out of there and he took my keys and he said left me this way you know what he defeated Satan Amen. and I believe that was something that was out before him I'm going to defeat Satan well let us take you off the off the cross no not till the job's done I'm going to defeat Satan lastly there was the joy of securing our home in heaven. Amen. Amen. Too many people, I believe, I believe he said, there's too many people depending on me. That was the joy. He said, I'm going to go prepare a place for them. And if I go and prepare a place for them, I will come again and receive them unto myself. Amen. Amen. And I can't do that if I don't defeat death. I can't give them eternal life if I don't defeat death. And so, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He suffered the shame. He did not come down. And I'm awfully glad he didn't. I thank God he didn't. I, I thank God he'll never have to do that again. Amen. You know, in Hebrews chapter 6, it uh, talks about that. If the first crucifixion did not do the job, we're in trouble. Because he says to ask a second application, Christ would have to come and die again because the first application proved to be uh, insufficient. But he said he won't come and die again. He doesn't have to. The joy the joy that was set before him. Now we talked about that person getting saved. Can I tell you this? I'm going to make it personal to me. 62 years ago, there was a little tow-headed boy at Oak Grove Baptist Church. Got up the last night of revival and went forward bowed and asked God to forgive him and save him. 
That was the joy that was set before Christ. That was me. And your testimony is the same. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, the Lord said it's worth it all. It's worth it all. Michael has a choir song. I believe it's a choir song that has the line in it. He'd do it all again. He'd do it all again. We were worth it. And he counted us as joy that was set before him.